We are in Luke, and kind of run through where we're at so we can remember where, where we've been. Uh, we've been in Luke for quite a while now. Uh, if you turn a few pages in your Bible, uh, you'll get to the triumphal entry pretty quick. So Christ is well into his ministry. Uh, he's well known. Uh, he's out there making friends and enemies, right? He, as Kevin said a few weeks ago, Christ's message, people either accept it or they hate it. And we're going to see more of that today where people are joyful about what Christ is doing and people are resentful about what Christ is doing. Uh, one of some interesting things that I learned as I was digging into Luke, kind of studying for this sermon, uh, Luke has an overall general focus on the outcast, the poor, the oppressed. Uh, specifically, Luke has more accounts regarding women than any of the other Gospels. And at this time, women were part of that vulnerable group and even more a physically disabled woman like we're going to see today. For the text, there's three points that I want to make, and they'll come up here later. You don't have to try to get them all down right now. Uh, the first point is God's heart for the hurt and broken. The second, recognizing God's love and adopting a heart of worship. And the last point, a focus on the letter of the law misses out on the heart of Christ. So let's get to the text. Um, as has been our custom when we're reading through the, the Gospels, We'll rise for the, for the reading um, so everyone can stand up. If you don't have a Bible, we're a church and we'd love to give out Bibles. I gave out a few first service and we'd give out a few more. I know where Kevin keeps the good ones so I can I get you a Bible. Um, so we're in Luke 13, verses 10 through 17. And it'll be on the screen. If you don't have a Bible, you can follow there. As he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath, a woman was there who had been disabled by a spirit for over 18 years. She was bent over and could not straighten up at all. When Jesus saw her, he called out to her, Woman, you are free of your disability. Then he laid his hands on her, and instantly she was restored and began to glorify God. But the leader of the synagogue, indignant, sorry, because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath, responded by telling the crowd, There are six days when work should be done. Therefore come on those days and be healed, not on the Sabbath day. But the Lord answered him and said, Hypocrites, don't each, of, each one of you untie his ox or donkey from the feeding trough on Sabbath and lead it to water. Satan has bound this do woman, daughter of Abraham, for 18 years. Shouldn't she be untied from this bondage on the Sabbath day? When he had said these things, all of his adversaries were humiliated, but the war whole crowd was rejoicing over all the glorious things he had done. Lord, we are grateful for your word, great opportunity we have here to dig into it to, and to know you better through it. Uh, we pray for this time, for your blessing on it, that just your word can be heard, uh, your heart can be known, and just that we can be convicted to, to uh, know you better and, and just, follow, just to follow the behavior of Christ that we see. Uh, as always, Lord, again, grateful for you, pray for your blessing on this time, and say it's in the name of Jesus. Amen. All right, you can go have a seat. So... Pretty straightforward. Love people in hard places and don't be mad when good things happen on the Sabbath. That's the end of the sermon. I don't know what takes Kevin so long to get to the point up here. I'm just kidding. So we're going to run through it. I'll probably take it a verse or two at a time and just kind of unpack what we see, people and, and settings, and try to just uh, pull out what, what we can learn. So first verse we're looking at is 10. As he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath. So that sets our setting, right? Jesus is in a synagogue. In Luke 14, 6, we see that it's Christ's custom to be in a synagogue on the Sabbath. That's what he does. Um, the interesting thing about this point is this is the last time we see Christ in a synagogue on the Sabbath. Again, this is late in his ministry. The, the religious leaders are becoming more and more resistant to him, and he may not be welcome in the synagogues uh, going forward. In fact, this story echoes a previous healing Christ performed on a man with a withered hand back in chapter 6. And again, at that time, it was the Sabbath. The religious leaders were watching. They were judging and angry of what he, Christ was doing because he had performed work on a, on, a, on a Sabbath. The other thing to just keep in mind is that it is Sabbath, the setting, and so it's probably very crowded. There's probably the people that are there every week worshiping, and then there's probably all these people that have come to see Jesus. So it may be even more crowded than normal. Uh, this woman we're about to read about, she may have been any one of those, either one of those groups. The so verse 11, 
A woman was there who had been, been disabled by a spirit for over 18 years. She was bent over and could not straighten up at all. So we don't get much about her. We know her condition, but we don't know if she is a regular attender, if she's someone who's come to see Christ. She doesn't ever approach Christ to request healing or something like that, like we see in other places. So maybe she's a regular. Um, we learn some more about her heart, I think, in the future, or in some of the future verses, but we'll, we'll wait and, and uh, talk about those when we get there. The one thing I do want to address is the spiritual element to her physical deformity. Both verse 11 and 16 talk about either the spiritual element or in 16, verse 16, Christ talks about how she's bound by the devil. So there is a spiritual element to this. The, the thing I want to unpack, though, is that not, not, all in, not all physical ailments are caused by an evil spirit, but some are. We see examples of both in Scripture. I know people have seen examples of both in life today. We can't ignore that either one exists. We also shouldn't drift into extremes when it comes to our belief in the demonic. In the Screwtape, tape, in the Screwtape letters, C.S. Lewis addresses this in his introduction. He says, There are two equal and opposite errors into which our race can fall about the devils. One is to disbelieve in their existence. The other is to believe and to feel an excessive and unhealthy interest in them. Again, when we find ourselves in the extremes, we need to step back and reevaluate. Specifically, I think in the Western culture, we fall into the category of disbelief. And in fact, that's, that's been um, something that I think has been pushed and brought up. And I think there's the saying that the, the greatest trick the devil ever played was in making people believe he didn't exist. In any case, we're told that there is a spiritual element to this woman's disability. Addressing her, there's no indication that the woman has a moral issue that's causing this. And in fact, if there were, Christ would likely have pointed it out. He's not afraid to call things out when he sees them. And while the Bible does depict many instances, instances of demon possession, it does not directly link a person's sin to, be, to the possession. When Jesus treated uh, those who were possessed, he often did it with compassion and focused on casting out the demons and did not blame the individual for their possession. So this tells us that there is, an, there is not a direct link between sins and a persons and, and the demonic. Christ also stated in other situations that a physical, ailments aren't, physical ailments aren't related to a sin issue. Uh, John 9, 1 through 3 says, As he was passing, as he was passing by, he saw a blind man from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Neither this man nor his parents sinned, Jesus answered. This came about so that God's works might be displayed in him. And that may be the case for this woman, that this physical disability has been with her for this long so that we could see God's works in her. The last point I want to make here is that while we believe that a believer cannot be possessed by a demon, the Holy Spirit, if the Holy Spirit's in you, there is no room for anything else. The light and the dark can't coexist with each other. However, we shouldn't ignore the fact that a believer can certainly be afflicted by a demon. We can't ignore the fact that spiritual warfare exists. But the answer is, like any good Sunday school question, Jesus. He has the power to heal both physically and spiritually. And that's what we're about to see. So let's get to verses 12 and 13 where we see the healing. When Jesus saw her, he called out to her, Woman, you are free of your disability. Then he laid his hands on her, and instantly she was restored and began to glorify God. This shows us God's heart for the hurt and broken. That's the first point I want to make. Jesus saw her. This woman would likely have been overlooked or even shunned by the general society. Uh, oftentimes, there was thought to be a, a link between physical and moral issues. So they may have thought this woman brought it on herself. It's her own fault that she's like this. And so she probably would have been treated very poorly. But Christ saw her, saw her in her condition, and he acted out of love and compassion for a broken person. I was reading a sermon by Charles Spurgeon that Kevin sent me when I was preparing for this, and he has a quote that I want to share because it really struck me. 18 years despondency must be a frightful affliction, and yet there is an escape out of it. For though the devil may take 18 years to forge a chain, it does not take our blessed Lord 18 minutes to break it. 
What a picture that was, would be for, as we think about the devil toiling away, building a chain, pulling this woman down, breaking her down. And then, woman, you are set free from your element. And in an instant, she's free. Christ has come to set people free. If you empathize with this, if you feel like you're broken down or you're bent over by heavy loads, if you feel like you've got a physical or emotional issue that's binding you, first off, I want you to know that God sees you. He sees you and picks you out of the crowd. Christ has repeatedly stated that those in the lowest or the least um, are in fact the highest, the most important, and the first in the kingdom of God. We see this in the Beatitudes. When we talk about blessed are the poor in spirit, the meek are those who are persecuted in my name. Or in Luke 4, when Christ quotes Isaiah, an Isaiah passage referring to himself. The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives, recovery, to the si- recovery of sight to the blind, and to set, f- the free, to set free the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. This woman was oppressed, and she was set free. And Christ can do the same for you. It may not be as dramatic as this woman's miracle. If, everything, if everyone got their miracle, there would cease to be miracles. But that doesn't take away from the fact that there is freedom in Christ. The other point I want to make is that if you are in this place, if you feel like you're broken or trapped, we want you to reach out. We don't all have Christ's perfect sight. We can't see all the hurt and people broken around, hurt and broken people around us perfectly. And so we're going to miss things. So please, reach out if you're in that place. Maybe God has put us in this place to be your miracle, or at least support you in your time of need. Uh, there are people who gather in the classroom here next door who pray for you after service. If you want to go in there and, and, and talk and, and pray with them. Any of the elders, any of our wives, Kevin and Kate, when they're back next week, would, would love to talk to you if you need help. Don't think you have to go it alone. Because we all want to mimic the heart of Christ and love people in all places, in all conditions. Next, if you're not in that place, if you feel loved, you feel accepted, you feel stable, it's your job to help people. Look around and ask yourself, am I seeing the people that are hurting around me? Is my comfort where I'm at blinding me to the people who are hunched over with heavy loads? Last week, uh, some of the church got together and we went and watched a movie called The Greatest Christmas Pageant Ever. Um, spoiler alert, I'm going to talk about the moral of the story. It's based on a movie, or it's based on a book from 1972, and there's been multiple movies, so I don't feel too bad spoiling that for you. <laughs> The Herdmans are a group of kids that terrorize the town. It's near and dear to my heart because when my kids were little, they were the Herdmans. <laughs> there's, a, there's a joke, a running joke in the movie that anytime there's a fire or there's smoke, someone says, what is it, another Herdman fire? My son Derek, when he was little, set our house on fire three different times. <laughs> and then once to even it out, he set off a fire extinguisher. So I love this story. The kids are are a terror. They run through town stealing, um, bullying, lying, whatever. Uh, And then one day, through some silly chain of events, they walk into a church. And they take up lead positions in the church's Christmas play, the nativity play that they do every year. Some of the people in church are really upset by this because this play is sacred. The play is sacred. They do the same thing every year, it's the same every year, and it needs to be the same every year. And these kids are ruining it. They didn't see the the, the hurt the Herdmans were coming from. They didn't see their background. They didn't see that they could have reached out and helped them. They were blinded by their comfort. In the end, the mom who fought to keep the Herdmans in the play was justified as the herdmen show that they knew the heart of Christ better than the people in the church. And there's a great moral in the story that the church does have a, open its eyes and start helping them. We need to see people around us. We need to use Christ's heart and his eyes to see those around us. It may be the couple of rowdy kids that need grace. It may be the scruffy-looking dude who just needs a kind word. Christ saw a woman in need and reached out. He helped her both with both his words and his hands. We need to follow that behavior and show compassion and kindness to those around us. 
We may, may not be able to heal the body with a touch or take away pain with a word. We know the Holy Spirit can do that, but sometimes that's not God's will, and we won't know why. But we can sit with each other, and as imperfect as we can, we can comfort each other. And if, we doing so, if by doing so we take the load from someone else, we should be grateful to do that because we want to mimic the heart of Christ. And like Christ reaching out with her hand, his hands, if there's a physical need, we want to meet it. I like to think that this crippled woman was helped by the people in her synagogue, that they knew her and helped her. We need to do that here. One of the ways we do that in our church is we have the, the hands and feet ministry that's available. You can sign up and you hear about needs that are happening in the church, and if you have a need, you can let them know and they'll spread the word. That's a great way for us to be able to meet the needs of people around us. So I just want to encourage everyone to go and, and sign up for that. We are the body of Christ. We're made up with many parts, each with specific gifts, and we should be using them to help each other. The next point I want to move on to is, do you recognize God's love and adopt a heart of worship? The woman immediately praised God. In verse 13, she was restored and began to glorify God. She responded exactly how you would expect and exactly how she should. We need to recognize the blessings in our life and show God the, great, the gratitude he deserves. We may not get the miracle that we are asking for, but maybe just not yet. This woman waited 18 years. How long did she pray for a miracle? How long did she pray for, for relief from that affliction? And yet, when she was healed, she came up praising, not asking, why did it take so long? We don't know what God's purpose is for hard things in our lives. We don't know why the timing is what it is. What we do know is we can trust him. Back in August, Kevin gave a sermon on Micah 8, or Micah 4, sorry. I remember it because his, I liked his, his witty title called Backs to the Future. And here's the synopsis for that. The future is often really fuzzy, and trying to figure out what is to come or understand what God is doing can leave us confused, frustrated, anxious, or even angry. How do we approach an unknown future? The focus of the sermon was looking back at God's faithfulness in the past and, and so that it can empower us with confidence to move forward in the future and worship, and worship God. If you're struggling to be grateful towards God because you're in a hard place, you're in a hard time, looking back at our history can be helpful in reminding us of God's faithfulness. As most of you know, my wife and I did foster care for, for nearly 10 years, and our family is unique and amazing because of that experience. But what few people see are the terrible days we went through to get there. The occasional fire, the days when the trauma and the anger and the sadness were too much. And there were days when Jackie and I would ask God, why, why are you doing this? What good can come from this? And there are still things that we don't understand why they happened. But looking back, I can see those times instilled the strength and understanding in my wife and children that nothing else could have. And so I can be grateful for God through those times and, and have faith in his faithfulness. I'm not saying this because we have it perfect, perfect, perfectly figured out. In fact, we still struggle, and I know everyone still struggles to praise God in hard times. It's, it's unnatural for us as humans to praise in hard times. But I want you to know that if you are going through a valley, God is with you. Though I walk through the valley of shadow death of death, I will fear no evil, for my God is with me. The God who heals all things physically, mentally, and spiritually, someday. This woman waited 18 years. Maybe you'll wait longer, maybe you'll wait shorter, but in the meantime, we can look for the small things to be grateful for and trust that a God, because we can look back and see his purpose and what we've gone through. Thess Thessalonians 5, 16 through 8 says, Rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. I look at this woman and I think she already had a heart of praise because of how quickly she came up praising. There was no delay. Everything that came out of her was praise. Our hearts need to be so used to praising God in good times and bad that that's our reaction. The woman showed us what to do. She showed us how we should react. Now we're going to move on to someone who didn't do so well. Uh, we're going to talk about the religious leader. 
The point here is a focus on the letter of the law misses out on the heart of Christ. That's the slide, Lance. This Lance is first time, well, second time running, running slide solo, so both of us are first timers. So verse 14. But the leader of the synagogue, in, indignant because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath, responded by telling the crowd, there are six days when work should be done. Therefore, come on those days and be healed and not on the Sabbath day. I think in context, all of us are shocked by that response. Jesus, had, he, This guy had just witnessed a miracle. Jesus had done an amazing thing. And he just turns to the people and tries to downplay it, tries to say that it was a bad thing. And in fact, by turning to the crowd, he's trying to turn them against Christ. Now, before we go too deep into this, I want to talk about the Pharisees and the religious leaders at the time, because I have a heart for them. When we look back and see the context in which they lived, the things that they knew, it's easy to understand why they were the way they were. Now, it's not easy to see why they missed God, missed Jesus right in front of them. He was performing miracles, speaking with authority, teaching truth, and even at times knowing their thoughts. They couldn't see him because they had a heart issue. Not because they didn't care, because they cared a lot. They didn't just, didn't just wake up one day and say, I want to put heavy loads on the people around me and watch. They looked at history. They looked at the things that had happened in the past. And their job was to make sure that people stayed within the law. I think Deuteronomy eleven twenty six through 28 was echoing in their mind often. Look, today I set before you a blessing and a curse. There will be a blessing if you obey the commandments of the Lord your God I am giving you today, and a curse if you do not obey the commandments of the Lord your God, and you turn aside from the path I command you today by following other gods you have not known. These leaders looked back at history, and they saw many prophets who had come through warning the people to turn back to Christ. Turn back to God, give him the worship he's due, and yet they didn't listen. And so, Jewish people were conquered by the Assyrians, and then by the Babylonians, and then by Alexander the Great. They came up for air for a moment during the Maccabean Revolt, and then the Romans came in. So these leaders were leading out of fear. They're afraid that people would step out of the lines and that more people would come in and oppress them. So they built in safety barriers. They built in rules on top of rules on top of rules. And pretty soon, the focus was flipped, and it was no longer about people, it was about rules. They'd focused on checklists, and we know that that's not what Christ wants. He points this out in verses 15 and 16. But the Lord answered him, saying, Hypocrites, doesn't each one of you untie his ox or donkey from the feeding trough on the Sabbath and lead it to water? Satan has bound this woman, a daughter of Abraham, for 18 years. Shouldn't she be untied from this bondage on the Sabbath day? The religious leader was stuck on a rule about what you could do on the Sabbath, and because of that, he'd stop seeing the woman as something of value. Christ's pointing out that the rule, there were rules that you could untie your ox or donkey and lead them to water, and there were even rules that you could tie them in a certain way, because tying knots on the Sabbath was actually against the rules but the woman could wait for the appropriate time. Again, in context, we're shocked by that response. We all are, don't know why this religious leader would respond like that and completely agree with Christ's assessment. We often look back and think we would have been better. We would have seen what Christ was doing and listened. But often, even nowadays, we put rules in front of rules before people. And when we do that, we're missing out on the heart of Christ and becoming like the Pharisees. And maybe you think, oh, I don't do that. But have you ever said, I can't believe they watched that TV show. I can't believe they eat that type of food. I can't believe they drink that drink. I can't believe they worship, or they, they worship in that style or, or even celebrate that holiday. If you apply personal convictions to someone else, you might become, become a Pharisee. I'd almost done a, you might be a redneck parody there. And just said, you might be a Pharisee if a couple times, but I'll spare you from that. 
This sort of judgment is called out specifically in Romans 14, which is a great chapter to go read, but I'll read you one, one through five. Welcome anyone who is weak in faith, but don't argue about disputed matters. One person believes he may eat anything, while one who is weak eats only vegetables. One who eats must, the one who eats must not look down on one who does not eat, and the one who does not eat must not judge one who does, because God has accepted him. Who are you to judge another man's household servant? Before his, before his own Lord he stands or falls, and he will stand because the Lord is able to make him stand. We shouldn't raise the disputable matters to a point where that's what we see, or that's what we value. Now, to be clear, there is a difference between theological truths, what we'd call a closed fist item, and something that's a secondary or third-level issue. The religious leaders had made everything a closed fist item, and so all they saw were rules. For our church, you can look at our statement of faith on the website. Those are the things that we've decided are our closed fist items, that we will hold on to and we would argue with you about. But outside of that, we leave things to people's personal convictions. In the case of the synagogue leader, the Sabbath was the question. What could you do on the Sabbath? The Sabbath was intended to help people, not burden them. And Pharisaical law had morphed the Sabbath into a burden and added so many restrictions that it had gone well beyond God's law. For someone to forcibly to forbid acts of mercy and love on God's day of rest is contrary to its purpose. Our takeaway from this is that we need to make sure we're putting the right things in the right order. If we're holding on to a belief with a right white knuckle grip, we need to question why. Does it honor God's heart? Should we apply this to all the people around us? We need to make sure our focus is on loving people and not loving laws. In the final verse of this section, we see the outcome of the interaction. Verse 17. When he had said these things, all his adversaries were humiliated. But the whole crowd was rejoicing over all the glorious things he had done. Christ had spoken the truth. There was no arguing with it. The crowd had recognized the good things that Jesus had done. And I think the religious leaders re recognized they were beat. When I first wrote, wrote that, I wrote the, rec the religious leaders recognized uh, that, they had, that they were in error. But did they? Did they leave walking away, evaluating their hearts, or did they harden them against Christ? And we do see some of the religious leaders, like Nicodemus or Joseph of, Joseph of Arimathea, who did see Christ and did change, but many didn't. Many hardened their hearts. For us, looking back at this section of Scripture as a whole, what do we need to evaluate as we walk away from this? This section of Scripture was an example of how Christ showed love for people. He saw a woman in need and he acted. He saw hypocrisy and he called it out. He didn't let rules get in the way of loving people. Are we mimicking that heart relationship in our lives? Jesus cares about people. He cares about you, and he wants to set you free from anything that binds you. He called this woman to him, and maybe he's calling you today. Is there something in your life that, that has bound you? Some past hurt, some secret, some broken relationship, some bitterness that has wedged itself into your heart? Christ alone has the power to heal. Come to him and be set free. If you want to talk about this, if you have questions, again, come see me. Talk to an elder. We'd love to talk to you about these things. I mean it, and I'm serious when I say we, we want to help. We want to mimic the heart of Christ and show you love and grace in the, whatever condition you're in.